Ah, oh, that just never gets old, does it, Dan? No way. Been here for two decades, and just that's what it's all about. Yes. Just live for people who the old is gone, the new has come. Do you remember when you got saved? Remember when you got baptized? Remember when your heart burned for the Lord? just want us to think about that today. I think that's the most beautiful thing about fresh blood and fresh faces, beginning a fresh relationship with God. It just does something to be like, man, remember those days. Don't forget those days. Man, last week, so powerful, 26 people raised their hand to cross the line and make the decision to follow God afresh. Isn't that powerful last week? Just saying, I want to do that. And in the week before, in our Hanley campus in prison, over 65 guys came and 14 inmates gave their life to Christ a, a week and a half ago. Just powerful stuff. You do know that we have a campus in Hanley prison, right? Do you pray for those guys? That thing's grown from like 40 to 65 and it's continuing to grow. People crossing the line of faith. It's powerful. It's powerful. And I'm all about just lifting up our voices. And it says in Romans chapter 10, all who call upon the name of the Lord will what? Be saved. We, we, we call upon his name to be saved. But I want to just take a moment and go back in chapter 10 of Romans, where it said all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And to realize it's, it's more than just a prayer. I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you it's more than a prayer. It's more than just a confession. It's more than going to confirmation when you were younger. It's more than catechism. It's more than just like, yeah, I was baptized or I take communion. It's more than that. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. It's the mouth, it's a prayer, but it's also your heart. And you believe in your heart, and then you profess with your mouth. And then it's Savior and Lord, you'll be saved if you declare that Jesus or Christ is Lord, that he's not just your savior, that he's Lord. He doesn't just save you from sin and hell. He saves you so that you can obey him and follow him. And he becomes the master and the leader of your life. Isn't like, Thank you for saving me. I've got fire insurance. Now I can go live like hell. No, no, no. If he saved you, something happens in the heart that transforms, that makes you want to follow him as Lord. I don't want you to stand before the Lord someday and be like, I prayed a prayer in 2004 and I just uttered those words and nothing changed in my life. Man, it's heart and it's mouth. It's profession and it's belief. It's Lord and it's Savior. Everybody got that? And I want to talk about a relationship with God that isn't just a prayer or the mouth or an activity or a baptism or a communion or just coming to church on the weekends. I'm talking about did your heart transform? Not do you believe God or I have faith in God or I accepted Jesus into my heart. Do you love Jesus? Are you in love with the person of Christ. I have a hunch that a lot of you here come to church and believe in God, but you know nothing of having a passionate love for Jesus. And that should be growing in our life if we know him as our personal Lord and Savior. I want to center on a passage of scripture in Philippians chapter 3. We're going to be in Philippians 3 the next few weeks in a series called Resurrection Life. Okay, Easter was last week. We live Easter every week around this church. It's not just like once a year 
51 weeks, we just talk about everything else. No, we are about death, burial, and resurrection every week. That we die, we're buried, and we come to new life in Christ and live out resurrection life. And in Romans chapter 3, Paul says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, becoming like him in his death, so as to somehow attain a resurrection from the dead. Do you know when he wrote this? Not the week after he got saved, not the week before he got saved. Not after he was baptized in the early years of his conversion. He wrote this 28 years after God knocked him off his horse, blinded him onto the road to Damascus, and changed his life. Nearly three decades later, he's like, I know him, but I want to know him more. And where he wrote this was actually it's part of the prison epistles. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon were written while he was on house arrest. Where people could visit him and he could write. But in house arrest, there was an armed Roman guard chained to Paul for Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And he wrote these with an armed Roman guard chained to him on house arrest. And it was only two years after he wrote this. He was on house arrest. Then he went to a prison in Rome. And then he was beheaded in Rome. This was the last of a free man. But this guy had never been freer in his heart in his whole life. Can you imagine writing in house arrest with a guard? Just, I want to know you. I want to know your power resurrection and your suffering and I want to continue to die to myself and come to life in you God it's been 28 years and it's as fresh as dew hanging off of a lily in my heart and this book of Philippians is known as the book of joy but if you read through it that joy comes from Christ Philippians chapter 1 he says to the church in Philippi that he started I long for you with the bowels of Jesus Christ. They didn't have any like way of describing deep love without, man, I feel it down in here. I long for you with the affections of Jesus Christ. In Philippians 1.21, I, I, for me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. And I'm about ready to die. If I'm going to live or I'm going to die, it's all Christ for me. It's the same one. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. I want his mind. I want his thoughts. I want his voice to drive me. In chapter 3, before the passage we just read, he says, Man, I consider everything that was gained to me as lost compared to the all-surpassing knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord. In fact, I've considered everything as rubbish or dung compared to knowing Christ. And I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and fellowship of his suffering. You know, Philippians chapter 4, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. God has supplied all your needs according to his riches in glory. It's Christ, this joy he has, chained like a criminal to that Roman guard. He's sharing that joy rooted in a personal relationship with Christ. And he's not like the disciples. He is just saying, Christ is real to me, but I have never seen him other than the road to Damascus where he showed up in a theophany. He was in relationship to Christ without his physical presence being with him, just like us. Sometimes I don't relate to the disciples. They're like, I don't know, I'm struggling, I'm going up and down. You got to walk with Jesus. I don't relate to you, but Paul I do. He had a burning passion for the Lord and he had to, by faith, realize his presence is with me. In fact, at his last defense, in the last book he wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said, at my first defense, nobody came to me. But the Lord stood by my side and shut the lion's mouth. The Lord didn't do that, and yet he did. He said, I know you're right here. No one else is here for me, but you're with me, Lord. Do you feel like that when you're in a hard spot? 
man, just passion rooted in, in Christ. So we read this verse, and I just want to do a little word study with you here. And I want to demystify that. A lot of times you're like, oh, you went to seminary. You're about ready to share some Greek words with us. You know now you can go to blueletterbible.com. Literally, write that down. Blueletterbible.com. And you can read down through Strong's Concordance, click on the word, see the Greek word, see a cross section of where it's used in scripture, and you can become a scholar and a theologian and a preacher and a pastor. I'm giving you something. This is, I'm demystifying it. This isn't because I'm awesome. You can be really awesome too. It's not like, oh, he knows all of the Greek and Hebrew words. Well, I did take two years of Greek class. I forgot it all. So I go... <laughs> to blue letter Bible. Let's go. I want to know Christ. The word want is epithumia, which is desiring, craving, longing, and pursuit. Chained like a criminal, like I still Want you so bad, God. I'm so turned on by you. Remember, this was written in the prison epistles. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. He wrote Ephesians in there too. And in Ephesians, he goes into this relationship between a husband and a wife. And he says, husbands, love your wives like Christ loves the church. And wives, submit or respect your husband as unto the Lord. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And those two will become one flesh. Chicka wah wah wah. This is what's cool. The verse goes on and says, this is the profound mystery. I'm speaking about Christ in the church. Like, no, you're not. You're talking about a man and a woman, and he leaves and cleaves, and cleaving is awesome, and come in one flesh. And he's like, the profound mystery is the way a man is with a wife and a wife is with a husband. This is the mystery. I'm talking about Christ is that way to the church, and the church is that way to Christ. I want to know you. I want you so bad. And that leaving and cleaving part, he even in the context of Philippians chapter 3 before that verse, he goes back and he says, whatever was gained to me, I consider that a loss compared to Christ. I've left all that stuff behind, all that was gained to me. He actually shared his resume and his pedigree of what was gained to him, of what everyone looked up to in him, of what made him above Everyone else in his class, he said these things. I had amazing parents, circumcised on the eighth day. They were faithful to our traditions. A great nation. I was of the people of Israel. A coveted lineage. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I have outstanding gifts. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I'm an excep exceptional education in regard to the law. I'm a Pharisee. Unparalleled passion as for zeal persecuting the church. Faultless devotion as for righteousness based on the law. I was faultless. This is all to my credit. And I consider all this a loss. All the gains to me are lost compared to knowing Christ. I have left this stuff and I have cleaved myself to Christ. Thomas Chalmers has called this the expulsive power of a greater affection. I've had lesser affections in my life when I met Christ. The expulsive power pushing all those other affections that I loved and wanted and, and was built up by and known by and identified by, those things are expulsed out with this greater affection for Christ. And he says, I consider all these things as rubbish or, or I think the King James says as dung. And the Greek word there is skubalon. It's where we get scooby dooby doo where are you? <laughs> skubalon comes from the excrement of dogs. Everything that was gained to me is like excrement or dung. Everything is crap compared to Christ. Wow. I want to know 
Christ, I want him. Have you noticed in your life that you'll want something and once you get what you want, you no longer want it? Because once you have it, you don't want it anymore. My, my boys are notorious for this. They want something. I get them what they want. And then two days later, it's out in the yard getting rained on and I run over it with a lawnmower. The minute they have it, they want something else. Not Paul. Not Paul. Paul's like, I've had you for 28 years and I still want you now more than ever. It's like marriage. Like in marriage, we're used to like there's dating and this courtship and there's an engagement and then there's a marriage. But in Christianity, it's you're married at salvation and then you keep dating God to get to know God better and better. You don't date and then get married in Christianity. You marry Christ and you keep dating him because you want him. I have a date night every Tuesday night. It's a sacred night. My kids know that's our night. It's a time where I get across from my wife. She gets across from me. We have great conversations. We fight on our date night. All the distractions, it's just me and you. Do we know each other? Are we missing each other? Do you still feel seen and loved and known and appreciated and vice versa? We have to keep getting to know each other. We are, interestingly enough, 27 and a half years into our relationship, and we're continuing to date each other. That's the way it's supposed to be with God. Jesus is asking, do you want me? Do you find yourself attracted to me? Do you want to know what I feel anymore? Do you pursue me anymore? That's God. It goes on in Philippians 3, it says, I want to know Christ. The Greek word there is gnosko which means to be aware of, to understand, to feel, experience, and be one with. This has less to do with intellect and more to do with intimacy. This isn't just like curriculum. Do you know all of these attributes and do you know all these scripture passages? You don't move down through bullet points with God. He's not saying, do you know me up here? It's do you know me experientially? A great replacement of that word is, God, I want to keep experiencing you the older I get. This is the difference between knowing God and knowing about God. I fear there's a lot of religious people that know about him but do not know him. Oh, I know my wife's birthday. I know a lot about her past. Do I know the deep her? This is what this word means. Do you know me? Not knowing about. So religion can all be about activity without intimacy. Like church attendance or religion without the relationship, just going through the motions. Laws without love, just following the rules. Knowing but not really knowing deeply, just knowing about. And it's easy to actually come and listen to messages by me or Ryan or John or whoever's up here. And you could easily get addicted to my relationship with Jesus. This is what happens in the cult of personality and churches where a pastor becomes like the all in all of a church and you're going to hear about what he knows about God, what he loves about God and his passion for God. Do you have a passion? Do you know? Do you want God? Because it can tell you right now you're not going to get to heaven and say, well, I just kind of plugged in my umbilical cord to Jason and he fed me and he's like, no, you never hooked into me. And you can live vicariously through your wife's relationship with God or your pastor's relationship with God or your parents' relationship with God. Do you know God? And do you want to get to know him more? This word knowing, it's interesting. I was looking up the Greek word. The first time it's used in the New Testament is when Mary had a child and it said of Joseph, he had not known her yet. He had no sex with her, and yet she was great with child. Knowing actually was this intimate, deliberate, passionate thing 
that was intercourse. That's the knowing we're talking about here. Full knowing. The late Timothy Keller said this about knowing and loving. To be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty life can be and can throw at us. To be fully known and deeply loved, this is the fullness of life on earth. I mean, the worst thing that can happen in marriage is feeling like you, ever, you know everything there is to know about your spouse. It makes you lazy. And when you're uninterested in knowing more, don't be surprised when your relationship becomes very uninteresting. Staying interested. I want to know Christ. I want to experience Christ every day. I hunger and thirst for him. My body longs for him. David would say that. My body longs for you. Like like. A man longing for water in a dry and weary land. When can I go and meet with God? You are my food, my portion, my, my song, my salvation. I long for you. Early in the morning, I rise to meet you. Your love is better than life. I want to know you more. This is salvation. You're not saved because of desire. You're not saved for works. But once you're saved, you work. And once you're saved, you desire because you understand the dynamic of the gospel. He gave his life for me. I owe everything to him. I want to know you. It's interesting, even as Peter denied Christ and Christ rose from the dead and came back to him, there's a reinstatement of Peter and do you, do you realize the question that Jesus asked Peter three times? Do you love me? Yeah, you know I love you. I mean, yeah, I do you love me? God, I know. Yes, I love you. Do you love me? Why do you keep asking that? Of course I love you. Notice he didn't say, do, do, you, uh, do you believe me? Do you accept me? Do you follow me? Do you trust me? All those things are good, but it's do you love me? Me, because knowing is expressed in loving. When on our 27th anniversary, Heidi and I, down to Mexico this last year, and every night we'd go through just a list of questions to ask each other. And I'm telling you, that was my favorite part of our time together. Just like I was learning things about her I'd, I'd never heard her say before. And do you know that your spouse changes? What she liked four years ago, she doesn't like that. That's not her burning passion anymore. I change once every 10 years. She changed once every 10 minutes. <laughs> and so you have to keep asking your wife, is that still what you like? Is that still what you want? Is that still what you feel? Is that still what hurts you? What hurts you now? This is the same with God. So what are you feeling today, God? What breaks your heart today, God? What do you want to do today, God? Where, where are you going today, God? I want to follow you. What's going? Just, I want to know your heart. Being seen, known, loved, pursued with more frequency and intimacy as time passage, passes, not less. This is all that matters in a relationship with people and with God. Two weeks ago, I was on a Saturday morning and I pray over and sort of the back uh, counseling room and I was preaching and praying and just sinking my heart up with God and my phone buzzed and I noticed it was my wife and so I picked up my phone and I am not kidding you, the euphoria that fell over me is something I've never experienced before. It was, in all of our years of knowing each other, one of the most or the most powerful expression of knowing and loving I've ever got from my wife. She said this, I don't tell you enough how proud I am of you and who you are and what you do and how you do it. I love how tender your heart is in times like singing old hymns with people that are in their end stages of life. 
I love how on the weekend you find strength to get through all the services when so many of the times you're functioning on such little sleep. You're not a complainer. You don't need the accolades. Your motive behind what you do is nothing about gaining recognition. You're just so good at what you do, and I love being on the sidelines of that, praying about this weekend and praying that your mind and heart are clear and full of energy. I love you, exclamation point. I've known her in dating and in marriage almost 32 years now, and she still knows me, and she still loves me. We're in a relationship with each other. That is what we all want. I want to know you, to keep pursuing and experiencing you, God, right up to the moment. It goes on, Lord, I want to know you, yes, The power of your resurrection, the word power is dunamis, right? It's where we get the word dynamite or dynamism or dynamic. And it's a part of a healthy relationship. There's this energy there. There's a spark. There's something special. There's something inspiring that fills you. When a relationship has no dynamic and no dynamite to it, it goes from flourishing to languishing. In your walk with God or your marriage, or your friendships. This word connotates strength and might and goodness and gifts. It's natural to be attracted to someone's charisma and energy and ability, but God is calling us to deeper fullness of relationship. To be drawn to God for his power is important. To believe in his power, to lean on his power is essential. To come to church because of how powerful it is. That was a powerful message or that was powerful worship or what a powerful Easter weekend we had last week. That's really good. But if we're not careful, we can be attracted to God for superficial positive effect. And, and that's not what it's all about. And when things aren't powerful and dynamic, we can drop God like a bad habit. And it's made me wonder as a pastor if I've actually taught our church how to suffer and rejoice in sufferings as a part of a healthy relationship with God. I was just talking to Kurt Mulder about this a few weeks ago. Is our church a church that knows how to suffer with God without bailing on him? Has it all been about power around here? Inspiration, attraction, blessing, success, upward mobility. Do people bail on God when things get hard or inconvenient or downright discouraging? Is the relationship I'm introducing people to built on dynamite and dynamism without deep training in the difficult side of any relationship, which is dealing with disappointment and discouragement? And if it's all up and to the right, do people really know the true God or just a caricature of God we've dreamt up in America? Am I making it harder for people to stay married to God because I've lied to them about what marriage is really like? Harder to be disciples because we have a skewed understanding of true discipleship, that it is power and it's suffering. That's worth pondering. I mean, we've seen this with the Lions this year. Everybody is showing up. It's funny how many Lions fans there are. I think it's grown by 10 times what it was four years ago. They love to be there at the tomb, but they weren't there at the cross. They weren't there for the fellowship of the suffering for the last several decades. They just showed up for the power of their resurrection. Any true Lions fans know what I'm talking about here? You've been wearing merch when they were oh and like 15. And now everybody's like, we got grit. We're built for this. Dan Campbell, look at the billboard. They're awesome. You show up for the power, but you ain't there for the suffering. It's called a bandwagon effect. It's called fair weather friends. It's called uh, capricious enthusiasm. God's like, are you just here for the empty tomb or the bloody cross? And so he goes on. Yeah, the power of his resurrection, but also the fellowship of his suffering. Relationship with anybody is about power 
and suffering. We know this because as people go into marriage, we have vows. You know, do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? Do you to have and to hold from this day forward? For better or worse, for sicker, for poor, rich or poor, for richer or poor, sickness and in health, till death do you part. And they're like, yeah, I can't wait to sleep with her tonight. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? When she's really sick, are you going to be there just when she's like top-notch healthy? Right now when she's like in her prime and she looks like a million bucks, but someday when she goes through menopause, are you going to still be with her? Easy. Am I talking to anybody here? <laughs> are you going to be with him just when he's got a six-pack and he's six foot two of twisted steel and sex appeal? Or are you going to, when he turns into just this floppy dad bod, you're going to still want that guy? <laughs> easy, easy. I, I know. At least she's rubbing your belly right now. I see that. Power and suffering. This is a relationship with God. If you got saved under any other pretense, you've been lied to by me, by us, by the church. I uh, got this video that Heidi sent out to our family thread recently, and uh, it was me sleeping. And she took a picture of me sleeping. And I got a video of it. Do you want to see this video? And this is the video of me sleeping on vacation last week. Anybody, anybody know that about sleeping with your spouse, like that snoring. She says, I snore, and I said, I don't snore. And she's like, you snore. When you get into a relationship, like, I can't wait to sleep with you. And then you sleep with me, you're like, I did not know that was part of sleeping with you. It's power, and it's suffering. In fact, I remember when I went out with my father-in-law to ask for my wife's hand in marriage and I took him out to a restaurant and we were talking and man I was killing it all the right answers he was asking me stuff and about his daughter and about me and my life and I was killing it and then he asked this question he was like what what are uh, some of my daughter's weaknesses that you've noticed like oh um I, you know I let's say she reacts she she overreacts some I said, but she's getting better at that. And I have never seen his face changed into anger. And he said, huh, uh, let's talk about that. He says, I don't want you to marry my, my daughter for the potential of who she'll become. If she never changes, will you still love her? I was like, actually, Yes, and she can get worse and I, worse, and I'll, I'll love her more. Is that the right answer, right? You know, you're like, uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, if she doesn't get better. He's like, because I don't want you to marry my daughter thinking you're going to change her and do who you want her to be, and then you'll love her. You love her in the bad and the good. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Power and suffering. Paul embraced both these things because 28 years prior when he first came to Christ, God literally told him to get ready for what he was to get ready for. In Acts chapter 9, right after he came to Christ, Jesus, this is in red letters in your Bible, gave a vision and said, this man, this Paul, was my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and the people of Israel. We love that. I'm your chosen instrument and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Imagine that at your salvation. You're going to be his chosen instrument. Also, I've got to tell you how much you're going to suffer. Do you still want in? 
He was under no illusion that it would be like anything else other than power and suffering, joy and sorrows. Heidi said this last week when my, when my sisters asked her, how's life going right now? And I heard her say, it's hard, but it's good. You ever felt that in life, like it's hard right now, but it's good. And in your relationship with God, there are sometimes it's going to be hard, but it doesn't mean it's not good. It's good and it's hard in a relationship. Goes on, becoming like him in his death. Death is from the Greek word thanatos, where we get thanos. I am inevitable. You like that movie, right? Thanatos. The loss of one's life. How do you like that part of a relationship where you lose your life? Where you're deceased. A part of you just dies and is separated from who you were and that relationship who you become. In America, the key verse for Christians is the promise of Jesus in John 10, 10. You will have life and life in abundance. Life to the full. That means when I come to Jesus, I have a lot of good things. And when I come to Jesus, I get even more good things. Why wouldn't you be, want that deal? Like if you're going to give me life and you're going to give it to me in abundance, I want that. So we get saved thinking, I'm going to get Jesus, and then that means all I'm going to do is get more of all the good stuff I already have. And Jesus also said in Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to his disciples who are wanting to follow him, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Die to yourself. Take up that cross that you're going to have to die on every day and then follow me. What, what about life and life to the full? That's life and life to the full. It's like even a full moon is half dark. And you're going to have life to the full, and I mean a fullness, a full-orbed life, life to the full. It's going to be more pain than you can ever imagine and more joy than you could ever imagine, more abundant in gratitude and more abundant in things that are going to hit you that you don't think you're ever going to recover from, I'll be right there for the life to the full. Marriage is both dying and living. That is the same with a relationship with God. In fact, I got done counseling a couple back in 2012 and we were talking about this dying and living component and I wrote it down this way in my journal back in 2012. Stay single if you're planning on staying single after you get married. Stay single if you plan on staying single after you get married. Otherwise, plan on attending your marriage and your funeral on the same day. Because coming alive to someone else doesn't happen unless you die to yourself in the process. That's a relationship. I got married. I was single. It was all about me. I bought a ton of baseball cards. I bought all the clothes that I wanted. I got up when I wanted. I went to bed when I wanted. I watched all the movies that I liked. I watched a lot of sports. And then I got married, and I went from 100% me to 50% me. And I was 50% her. And then we had a kid. And it was 33% me. And then we had a second kid, and it became 25% me. And then we had Taylor, and it became 20% me. And then in our late 30s, we adopted two sons, and I catapulted to 14% me. Because every time you, you make yourself available relationally to other people, part of you dies so that other people can live. And that's maturity. There's some people they get married and it still says 100% them, and then they're 100% divorced 100% of the time by the time they're in their fourth to seventh year. With Jesus, he said, deny yourself, kill yourself, 
Crucify yourself. Paul even said, I am crucified with Christ in Galatians 2.20. And I no longer live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have been crucified with Christ. Romans 6, he said, I've been buried with him in his death that I might raise again in his resurrection. That's why I love baptism. We die to ourselves and we raise up and say, I'm following you. My life is yours now. I've crucified myself and my sin. And now I'm about you. I'm a living sacrifice for you, God. And then he says, when you die to yourself, goes on, it says, somehow attaining the resurrection of the dead. The word resurrection is ex anastasis, new life. Rising again, coming alive. So many of us making a living, having a life. But I want to ask you, are you alive in your heart? It goes without saying, but in order to experience resurrection life, you've got to die. You have to die. In order to, you know, be born again, you actually have to die. You know, I'm born again. But I never died. So I guess I was just born, but I was not born again. To live in Christ and his resurrection is to die. John 12, Jesus said it this way in verse 24, very, very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many Seeds. Anyone who loves their life or clings to their life will lose it. But anyone who loses their life for my sake in this world will keep it for eternal life. You keep it, you lose it. You give it, you gain it. Come to me. Bury yourself in the earth. It's dark down there. It's damp down there. You will think you're never going to come back from this. But when you bury yourself, something grows and you burst forth and you move from one single seed to much fruit in your life. This is resurrection life. How many of you love when it's the Lord's will in a season where he buries you and you think it's over? And he only buries people so that they'll germinate in that place and not stay a single seed. Some of you are staying a single seed in your life. And God wants to bear fruit with tons of seeds in it that spread and plant and multiply. But you don't want to be buried to die so that you can come up and bear fruit in resurrection life. This is a relationship with God. Philippians 3, I want to know Christ, yes, in the power of his resurrection and in fellowship with his suffering, becoming like him in his death, so somehow to attain a resurrection from the dead. It's knowing and wanting and power and suffering and death and life. It's that way in friendships, it's that way in marriage, and it's that way in a relationship with God. Six prayers from Philippians 3, 10 and 11. God, I want to want you more. Give me a burning desire for you. God, I want to know you more. Let me experience you each day. God, I want to feel your power. Show me your glory and power. God, I want to suffer with honor. Help me to embrace your pain in my life. God, I want to die to myself, bury my selfishness and pride. And lastly, God, I want to come alive to you. Raise me to a new life of joy every day. Every day. Some of you know that we had some altercations with the Catholic Church in town this last week. And if you don't know that, um, it was on Lowell Chatter, and he was sending me messages. And I'm on vacation with my family, and I'm like, man, um, Chernobyl is happening in Lowell right now. And I didn't know really what was going on, and... and uh, 
But I'll be honest with you, I was just keeping my heart in a posture of, God, you're at work in this. It's, it's sad when churches kind of fight with other churches or proselytizing or trying to one-up or trying to like diminish one in order to elevate themselves. And I've been guilty of it. So the, the blessed friar or father or whatever they're called there, um, I, I sort of felt like, man, I've been there. I haven't articulated on Facebook, but I've been there. And I, I want you to know like, there's been good reconciliation in that between he and I. He just wrote me last night and um, just some apology and, and uh, I love that. We're all, we all make mistakes, right? We're all human. But I think there was things like, you know, and, and look at that church. It's all about the lights and the screens and, the, and you can go anywhere for that. And, and I can go over there and it's like it's all about statues and a robe and and, you know, relics and all this stuff. And do you know all that? All that stuff doesn't mean anything. None of it. All the Catholic stuff, all the Protestant stuff, evangelical stuff, Lutheran stuff, denomination stuff. We've all come up with that stuff. This is the stuff. This is the stuff. If you're... And I pray for that parish that they connect themselves to Christ with all their traditions and I can blow apart all their traditions and they can blow apart all our traditions and philosophies. All the philosophies, all the festivals, even in Colossians chapter 2 it said, all these things are but a shadow of Christ himself. They're just shadows. It's just modes and methods to awaken people and to connect with people. But if all that stuff in his parish or in our congregation distracts you from the relationship with Christ, well, then we have a problem. This is what it's about. It's about Jesus and connecting with Jesus. And I want you, you're all going to die. You're aware of that, right? I'm going to die, you're going to die, and someday you're going to be right in front of the man I just talked about. Eyes of fire, sword coming out of his mouth, brilliant in all his glory. You're going to look at him, and I want you to say, I always knew it was only ever always about you. You're the one who covered me. You're the one who saved me. I wanted to know you after I got to know you more and more and more. And now I'll see you. I would hate for you to get in front of Jesus and be surprised by meeting him. I want you to know him now. You're going to know him. Philippians or 1 Corinthians 13, it says, when we see him face to face, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, and we will know even as we are known. And I want you to be like, God, you look a lot like, and I recognize you. I got to know that's who you were. And now that I'm looking at you, I finally get to meet somebody that I knew all along. I don't want to just bow then. I want to bow now. I want to know you. And for those crusty Christians in here that have known him forever but have no burning passion, no wanting, no knowing, no power, no suffering, no death, no life, may our hearts be lit ablaze fresh for the person of Jesus Christ and say, man, I consider everything else as crap compared to you. You're my all in all. That's what I want, God. That's what I want our church to want. So with all our distractions that we have in our life that pull our affection and attention from you, God, may you clean us and clear our eyes and clean our hearts so that we move into relationship with you this week. It's not just one service. It's our lives. We give our lives to you. Use us this week. Help us to have God sightings all week long. To see you everywhere in people. Stir us, Lord. We want to know you.
like Paul, 28 years after coming to know you, to have a burning passion, even in prison, chained to an armed guard. All I want to know is Christ. I want to know you. I never want to stop getting to know you. Give our hearts that jump start today. We, we love you. We're in your ambassadors this week. So use us as your ambassadors to take you to the world. And we pray this in your son's beautiful and holy name. Amen. Amen. Hey, you can be dismissed. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.